Good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to Thursday morning Cosmic Coffee. Following our our, our online streams, uh, you've seen Joe's before on Cosmic Coffee and on various other things like our, our giant Messier Marathon event and many others. Um, in some recent Cosmic Coffees, we've we've talked a little bit about the properties of stars and and how we classify them. You can go back in our YouTube feed and and find uh, find all those shows. And in general, we've been we've been talking about sort of how normal stars work and how they evolve and how we classify them. So we thought uh, it might be interesting to do a cosmic coffee where we talk just a little bit about a couple of the many types of much more bizarre objects uh, that we find out there when we when we look in the universe. You know, most stars are not just quiet sedate single stars, but they have lots of interesting characteristics. So Joe's is here to tell you about some of those. If we have time, I might tell you about a few more. And as always, we can take any questions in the chat. So at this point, I'm just going to pass uh, the show over to Joe's. Morning, Joe's. Thanks for joining us. Uh, good morning, Jeff. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and pull up my little presentation doodad. Okay. Here it is. Uh, but yeah, so we are going to talk a little bit about some of those uh, strange stars that are out there. Uh, but uh, since um, some of you guys might be joining us for the first time here at Lowell uh, on our YouTube channel, I figured I'll give a little bit of background, just a short bit of background on just some basics about like stars and how they do their stuff. And uh, uh, stars just like just like people, they, they kind of live lives. They have starts and they have ends and uh, they go through various stages in their growths. I always like to describe stars, uh, they evolve like Pokemon do. <laughs> uh, so they have various stages in their evolutions, except I think it's a little bit more complicated than Pokemon. <laughs> uh, but uh, of the way that a star lives its life is gonna be entirely dependent on how massive the star is in the first place. Our own sun is classified as a small star. Uh, so its life is gonna sort of take this uh, top route here. Uh, it starts in a planet, not a planetary nebula, a stellar nursery and all of that gas starts to collapse and condense down on itself. And it starts to form hundreds of hundreds or even thousands of stars. And uh, they'll either be small stars or large stars. And when we say small and large, we're talking about mass for the, these particular uh, growths here. And uh, our sun being a small star after, after living a very long life of seven to 10 billion years, it will eventually expand itself into a red giant star. And uh, the thing that stars do best uh, besides shining obviously is it is fusing heavy elements in its core where the temperature is the hottest and there's the most pressure. And currently our sun is fusing hydrogen into helium. Uh, but once it expands into a red giant star, it's going to start converting helium uh, through fusion into other heavy elements. And that's how all the elements in the universe uh, are made as they're made from stars and typically you're not going to find the stars fusing anything heavier than iron in its core. Our sun probably won't fuse anything heavier than the oxygen uh, before it's all done. Uh, and then of course it's going to eventually expand out even further into a planetary nebula, which you can see uh, this is a picture of the clown faced nebula right there. And a planetary nebula and a white dwarf, they can, they can actually coincide with each other. It's not one and then another. You'll often find the white dwarf inside this planetary nebula, just right here. You can see a white dwarf there at the center. And so this is going to be enshrouded in like kind of layers and layers of like gas bubbles. Uh, they're gonna be made of various gases that were made during the star's life and they've kind of been shed outwards. And then eventually all of that gas does disperse and then we have a white dwarf star, uh, which is no longer fusing heavy elements and is just this hot dense ball of material uh, that is over the course of many, many billions of years is cooling down over time. Then there's the large stars, which they live shorter and much more exciting lives than small stars like our sun, uh, large stars like uh, Betelgeuse or Rigel, for example, they are on this lower track down here. 
and uh, they do the same stuff. They fuse heavy elements in their cores and they can start fusing even heavier elements than oxygen and carbon and stuff, all the way up to number 26, iron. And uh, they, they get a little unstable. They live really short, short lives on the orders of tens of or hundreds of millions of years uh, before they have a core collapse, which triggers this chain reaction as everything collapses down, everything starts bouncing back out and it causes this big explosion, which is called a supernova. And supernovas are some of the most energetic and brightest events to happen in the universe. Uh, so this particular supernova right there, that's our Crab Nebula, which is the brightest supernova in the Northern Hemisphere. And at the center of that, uh, you're most likely going to find a neutron star, which is the collapsed core of this massive star. And neutron stars are so small and incredibly dense <laughs> that all of the protons and electrons have basically neutralized their charge. And that's why, that's why it's made of just neutrons. And then uh, really, really massive stars, the most massive stars, those are the ones that whose cores will collapse into black holes, which intrigue everybody, of course. Uh, so that's, th that's kind of just uh, the, short, the short talk about how stars live their lives. And uh, we'll also just find out here, there's kind of various stages in between all of these. It's not, not usually just one and then the other. They go through all sorts of stages. Uh, now, the way that we classify stars is we can use the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram and or the HR diagram which is easier to remember for sure. And this is, this is probably my favorite graph in all of ever right here on the lower, the lower axis here on the X, we have temperature. Uh, and, if you, and if you can see that this temperature is in Kelvin, which is uh, much better than Celsius or Fahrenheit when we're talking about astronomy numbers, uh, but we'll use the hottest temperatures on, closer to the left side of the graph and the cooler temperatures on the right. So it's kind of switched from normal graphs that we read. And uh, they have these little numbers here. Uh, we these are our stellar classifications. So like if we're talking about an O-type star, uh, it's going to be something that's really hot on the order of 30 to 40,000 Kelvin. So we have O, B, A, F, G, K, M. And astronomers have, they have mnemonic devices that they use to try to remember these. And the one that I learned in college was kind of problematic. So I'm not gonna teach you guys that one. I'm gonna teach you the one that my classmates and I came up. Uh, our, <laughs> our first astronomy teacher that we had in college, her name was Dr. Barlow. And so uh, she was notorious for being a very difficult teacher. So we had old Barlow's astronomy finals gonna kill me. <laughs> and that's how I remember. O-B-A-F-G-K-M. <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> and I, I just, let me just insert quickly um, to for the viewers, if you go back a show or two, um, it, these, these, number, these letters seem to be in just this hodgepodge order, but there's actually a reason <laughs> for the strange array, uh, sequence of the, the numbers, uh, the letters, and you can find that in a previous show. It's basically a, a, me it, it's a measure of the hydrogen, uh, the strength of the hydrogen lines in the spectrum. <clears throat> Mm, okay. Yeah, I remember learning about that, but I've simply forgotten. Yep. <laughs> um, and then on the y-axis here, we have our luminosity, or uh, in regular people's terms, that's how bright the star is, really. <laughs> and so all the brightest stars, the most luminous, the most energetic stars, they're going to be on the top right up here. Um, and you can kind of see the hottest and the brightest stars are usually are all up in this corner here. The hottest are usually the brightest, and that kind of that kind of tracks that uh, something that's hotter is going to have a lot more energy. Uh, but then we have these giants and super giants over here as well. Yep. And then this line right here, this is called a main sequence, and stars live their most of their lives on the main sequence. Like ninety percent of the life is spent right over here. Uh, and our sun is currently right here. It is a main sequence star. So it's in what I would like to call adulthood for stars. Yeah, um, <laughs> sort of middle age. I'm also, I'm really pleased that, that you're uh, remembering um, Dr. Barlow in, in your mnemonic. Um, she, uh, uh, as you know, last, passed away last year, much too soon. And she was uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a giant of the Flagstaff astronomy community and a preeminent uh, Mars researcher. And, and we miss her very much, but uh, I'm sure her finals were challenging because um, she 
she knew how to teach the subject. Yeah, I don't know. I somehow managed to get through her class pretty easily. So <laughs> um, I think that was the first astronomy. That was the first astronomy class that I had had Dr. Barlow, and then uh, they all got harder from there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yep. so, uh, but yeah so it was a nice introduction to like college in general <laughs> um uh, but yeah so that's just like uh, we have these uh, this main sequence and then we have these red giant um branches that tend to come off there's lots of different branches that we find uh on our hr diagram and this one's much more simplified so we can see some of these common star names yeah, but it's it's also neat to, if you look at the y axis that's a logarithmic axis so mm -hmm. every tick mark there is a factor of 10 in brightness so these these very massive stars are immensely brighter than the sun like 10 to 100,000 times the luminosity which is one of the reasons they don't live very long they're they're just mm -hmm. burning their fuel or fusing their fuel at a tremendous rate yeah and we can also see that ages uh someone put in like that you can see that the shorter lives over here are for the hotter stars and the longer lives are going to be for the cooler stars down here because we just because of what you were saying as they yep. are much more luminous and energetic. And uh, one other thing that should probably be noted is that uh, the majority of the stars in the galaxy are these little red stars right down here. Um, maybe about 98% or so of these uh the stars in our galaxy are these little red ones so everything up here these are rare <laughs> relatively speaking <laughs> uh, but uh, i also noticed they are some of the brightest stars and usually when you point at a star that you can see without any binoculars or anything you're pointing out one of these rare stars because they tend to outshine the other ones uh, all right so we can uh talk about some of these strange stars that we have. And uh, this one, this first one is called the Methuselah star. And I actually remember like when the paper was released for this one and I thought it was really weird. Uh, this, this HD 140283, that's its catalog number. So most stars after you can't see them anymore, you end up just like cataloging them and they have all these strange, <laughs> these strings of numbers going on. And so we have a picture here of the Methuselah star. And the one thing that's interesting about this star is that it is probably the oldest documented star or the oldest one that we've found so far at about uh, 14 billion years old. And that's what makes this star kind of weird is because there's not been any other stars that are uh, that old that we have found. And just to put things into perspective, the estimated age of the universe is 13.8 billion years old. And so now we're over here thinking, uh, what? <laughs> why, why is this? How does this happen? Right? How do we have a star that is older than the universe itself? And uh, chances are probably it probably isn't older than the universe. We do have margins of errors here. You can see even the low margin of error for this estimated of the age of the star puts it below the age of the universe. So uh, no, nothing, nobody's wrong. No, no physics is being broken or anything. Right, uncertainties <laughs> abound in astronomy, but but it's true, you know, you look at the lower part of the, the HR diagram in the main sequence and and yeah, you, you saw the lifetimes plotted there and you're getting stars that would just take longer than the known age of the universe to, so, so if, essentially they'll shine forever, although very, very, very faintly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these stars are definitely some of the oldest stars out there. Uh, but yeah, um, I lost my train of thought there for a second, but uh, this star is uh, thought to be what we call a population two star. Uh, so we have uh, three different populations of stars and our sun uh, would be considered population one, which means it's a second or third generation star and it's what we would call metal rich. Uh, and in astronomy terms, metals are anything heavier than helium. So <laughs> just heavy elements in general. And so our sun having been formed from uh, gases that came from other stars and other supernovae that happened a long time ago, it's going to have a lot more heavy elements uh, 
in it compared to some of these stars that we see in the early universe. And uh, this one would be a candidate for what we would call a population two stars, which would be the very first stars that formed, it's the very second stars that formed after the beginning of the universe. So we'd have the very earliest stars in the universe. They, uh, they were these big massive stars and they had really short lives and they all went supernova pretty early and they scattered their guts out into space. And then these stars, like the Methuselah star, those formed from all of those guts of the very first stars in the universe. And so this one, this one is a red giant star, I believe. Uh, and uh, it's still going, it's still going in life, which is pretty impressive. Uh, so it's probably not older than the age of the universe, but it's definitely was one of the earliest, earliest stars to form. So, which makes it weird. <laughs> Uh, we have Myra, which uh, if I'm if I shouldn't be lying to myself, I probably would would have to say this is my favorite star. I never say it's my favorite star, but I never realize how often I actually want to look at this star when we do telescope viewings. I'll be like, let's look at Myra, and everybody else is like it's kind of boring. I'll be like, no, it's not. <laughs> uh, Myra is a it's a red giant star but it has a variability to it so it actually changes in brightness pretty regularly actually and this uh, graph up here this is a light curve and you can see the time the time on the bottom here is on a matter of years so this light curve was taken over six years or so and you can see that it has these dips in its brightness about once a year it will it will dip in brightness or I should say, it actually gets really bright and it suddenly appears. And that's kind of where it got its name from was because Myra is a Latin word that uh, translates roughly to uh, wonderful or beautiful because it does suddenly kind of just appear. So uh, this star, it does, it changes its brightness pretty, pretty frequently. And the reason behind this is it's sort of, it's in the end stages of the red giant stage right before it turns into a planetary nebula. And if there are stars uh, that are out there that are like Myra that have these long periods of variability, uh, we call them Myra type variables. So they're pretty, they are pretty famous stars. And Myra is the first one and the prettiest of them all for sure. You can see this picture down here at the bottom, it has like this little gas cloud uh, trailing behind it. And that's a whole bunch of gas and dust that it's leaving behind as it moves through space. So we can actually track pretty well where this star is going. <laughs> now what's happening is it is uh, kind of pulsating in size. And so it will kind of blow up in size. And when it blows up, it not like explode, but like, just like a balloon, <laughs> I guess, it blows up in size. And then there's this envelope of dust that's enshrouding it that kind of gets kicked away. And all of the starlight underneath that, it actually comes out and it starts to shine a lot more brightly. Uh, but then it shrinks back down in size and this envelope of dust kind of comes back down with it and is it's a lot more dense so you can't see through the dust as well so it's not shining as brightly yeah. um, i've heard someone describe myra as a uh, pig pen from the charlie brown comet kind of i love that picture with this, <laughs> this, this this is one of my favorite pictures with this trail of, of sort of garbage or, or you know celestial debris trailing behind this star as it plows along we actually um had a question in the chat that uh goes straight to something i was going to point out um jasmine asks what the magnitude of the star is and you can see that there on your plot and i was going to ask you to point out where sort of the limit of of visual visibility is on on a, yet another logarithmic scale here <clears throat> uh yeah so this so right here we have the magnitude and the brighter magnitude is at the top of here so two uh, is the brightest that this one seems to get to at one point or maybe even just a little two and a half or so right uh, which is really pretty bright i i think sirius is like a negative one and then we have vega which is about magnitude zero yep. and the faintest stars that we can see unaided, no telescope or binoculars, is about six and a half or so. So six is right down here. 
And you can see that this gets much fainter than that. And each magnitude, again, is logarithmic. So a magnitude three star is going to be 10 times fainter than a magnitude two. So this is how much it changes in its brightness over the course of a year. So its variability is about 11 years. It goes through one period, I think. Not 11 years, 11 months. Months, yeah, yeah. And, and that's, <laughs> that's a major brightness change from three mm -hmm. to nine. I mean, that's more than a factor of 100 in brightness. So it's incredibly variable. Uh, this one, this starts located in the constellation Cetus. So we're not going to be able to look at it or anything tonight. You have to wait until fall when it starts to come up along with Perseus. Uh, but every year, every year I get excited to look at Myra. Yep. Um, there we go. So we have uh, this star right here, whose name we don't say more than twice, <laughs> because then things start to happen. Uh, but this is Betelgeuse, which is actually a pretty famous star. It is, I, this is the one that I always say is my favorite star. <laughs> and uh, it's up in the early, early evening, but it's starting to set below the horizon now. This is one of the winter, winter stars. And it's in the constellation Orion. And you can see Orion um, pretty clearly in the picture over here. You have Betelgeuse, and then you have Orion's belt, and the famous Orion Nebula down here. So this is the whole constellation, and not just Betelgeuse. And I did say it three times, I realize. <laughs> uh, but Betelgeuse is famously a red supergiant star. And that's not what's abnormal about it, though. So. We always like to get excited because this is one of the candidates that might go supernova next. It's really old <laughs> in super giant age years anyway. It's really old. It's a, uh, it does have, it has had some uh, instability in the past before. And this one, we always get really excited that this one could go supernova while we're alive. It could, it could happen in our lifetime. Uh, which I th everybody that I've talked to really wants to <laughs> wants to happen, and nothing here ha would ha bad happen would here on earth would happen here on earth. I know how to say words. Uh, this is about six or seven hundred light years away from us, and in order for you to like get hurt in a supernova, you have to be within like fifty light years from a supernova. So we're well within we're well out of the splash zone for this one. So what we would see when this goes supernova is it would it would suddenly turn very bright. This would look like a bright star in the middle of the daytime. If Betelgeuse was up in the day, you would still be able to see it. It would be brighter than the moon. You can probably read bright by it. And uh, that's really exciting. And astronomers are always just absolutely just like, yes, I hope it happens. But our margins of errors put this to, you know, going supernova now or like 100,000 years from yep. now. So <laughs> don't, don't hold your breath, right? That's what I usually say. About yeah. <laughs> I'd like to note for the viewers, um, if you want to see a whole show, you know, you mentioned it's had some variability in its stability. Go all the way back to Cosmic Coffee number one. Uh, <laughs> astronomy, our astronomer Phil Massey uh, studied that weird dimming episode that it had, kind of like Myra. It got really, it got a whole magnitude fainter and then it came back and everybody was rooting for the supernova, but it turns out <laughs> that's not what it was. <laughs> uh, and that's why I decided to bring this up because that's, that's what makes this star kind of weird. <laughs> Uh, yeah. was, uh, yeah, back in 2019 and 2020, at the beginning of um, 2020, this star, which is typically like the ninth brightest star, dropped a lot and it became like 23 or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> and this, it, go, go ahead. It was barely noticeable. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was interesting to go out and look at it. And these are good examples. You know, I think uh, a lot of times we think of the universe as just constant and unchanging, but you can actually see these changes. So it's with stars like Myra and, and Betelgeuse. Um, one thing to point out, and then one question on the chat. I really like this picture. If you, you have to squint, but you can just barely see the famous um, Horsehead Nebula right in there under the, the lowest star in the belt. There it is. Yeah, right there is tiny little 
famous nebula. Um, question from going back to Myra from Third Echelon Securities. What effect does a Myra have on, on surroundings? Does it collect, collect debris as it travels or is it shedding? Uh, so uh, Myra is shedding debris. Uh, so all of that stuff that you see, that trail, uh, used to be part of this star that it's now just decided it doesn't want anymore and just kicked out. And so it's kind of leaving it behind as it travels through space. Yeah, yeah these, these huge, and, and you know, these big super giants, I mean, they have really strong, uh, they're very luminous, they have strong winds, and they're, they're losing mass at a pretty much larger rate, for instance, than just the sun, which also loses mass, but it's really sedate compared to these very luminous objects. <clears throat> Yeah, and that can the same can actually be said for Betelgeuse uh, as well, which is we're, what we're pretty sure contributed to all of that uh, dimming that happened last year. Um, we were we were all rooting for it to go supernova, but it's now since gone back to its normal brightness. And what most people seem to agree on is that this kind of like shed out a whole bunch of dust, kind of like Myra does. It just spit out a whole bunch of dust. And so there was this dust cloud that was obscuring our view of it. That's right. Um, but, but that dust cloud is kind of since uh, dispersed and we can see it again. <laughs> yeah, right. And to see how, how we figured that out, you can go back to Cosmic Coffee number mm -hmm. one and we talk about that at some length. Yeah, I remember what, that was like a year ago now was right after COVID hit. And it's like, well, how are we going to keep doing outreach? Let's do it. On, let's ramp it up <laughs> online. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, these stars, I swear, they just get weirder and weirder. I, I feel like we have some YouTubeception here because I've like <laughs> put in a YouTube video from NASA <laughs> as one of our little uh, animations that we have. Uh, but the next, the next really weird star is called the zombie star, and it got its nickname uh, because it's essentially a star that died and then is still, oh, still there at the same time. Uh, so we have various types of supernovae. When a star gets old and its core collapses, like what's going to happen with Betelgeuse, it's going to be a type 2 supernova. It's a little counterintuitive to talk about type 2 first. <laughs> Uh, but it's a type two supernova type two first. Uh, but then we also have type one supernova, and specifically, this one is a type one A supernova. Um, and this one, this one right here, Tycho supernova, is another one that was a type one A. And so, what happens? I'm going to go ahead and I'll play this little video, and we can see that there's a white dwarf that's a companion to a much larger star that's nearby to it. And the white dwarf will actually start to steal matter off of the companion star until eventually uh, it gets enough mass that it can trigger fusion in the white dwarf again. Um, let me play that again. I have to get out of here. There we go. Play. <laughs> uh, so it'll trigger fusion in this old star that wasn't fusing anymore until it actually explodes like a supernova again. And uh, usually in a type 1a, uh, the companion star and the white dwarf, they, they'll just, they're obliterated. They look like this mess right over here, the Tycho supernova. Uh, but sometimes uh, you might have a little bit of white dwarf star uh, left over. And this is our zombie star. Uh, so, so it survived a whole explosion and it's basically come back to life after that. <laughs> uh, so these ones are really weird. And I actually talked about the zombie stars way back when we did our spooky astronomy last Halloween as well. <laughs> I right. always think they're pretty cool. I, last week I was on a Zoom call and one of the astronomers on the Zoom call had a, a frame, a picture of Tycho's supernova in the background. And we were, we were sort of joking how it bears up, up. <laughs> A vaguely passing resemblance to a certain virus we're all <laughs> really oh <weird. laughs> I didn't see that um <laughs> until now thanks <laughs> now, now you'll never unsee it <laughs> I just thought it looked kind of like a hairball yeah right <laughs> <laughs> um uh these ones are the most strange I would probably have to say are the thorns ah, I yes. stars. Uh, and I first learned about them when I was in college, but 
uh, here at Lowell, we're kind of, we kind of have an affinity for them because uh, uh, Thorne Zaitkov stars, they were theorized by Kip Thorne and Anna Zaitkov way back in the 1970s. Uh, but we didn't have any like stars that we thought might actually exist until uh, our Lowell astronomer Phil Massey and um, uh, his colleague and Emily Levesque, I think is her pronunciation for her name, they discovered, or they didn't discover the star, but they discovered a candidate uh, for one of these types of stars. And uh, back in 2014, I believe. And uh, when I first met Dr. Massey, uh, that was like the first thing I learned about him. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Uh, now, uh, what this kind of star is, you can kind of see from this uh, little illustration over here. Uh, the idea is, is that during a supernova, a supernova could kick the neutron star, that's associated the, the collapsed core of the star, it could kick the neutron star way out into space, and it sends it off, and it collides with another star. And that neutron star can become part of that other star. And so we'd have a neutron star inside a red giant star, pretty much, <laughs> which sounds absolutely wild. And I couldn't explain more than that, but you know, I'm sure Phil Massey would be happy to. <laughs> yeah, maybe we can do a show on these sometimes of really strange things. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so he and Emily Levesque back in 2014, this star HV212, 2112, uh, they discovered that it might actually be a candidate for one of these uh, really wild stars. And this is located over in the small Magellanic Cloud. So this is in a whole separate galaxy right here. And um, <clears throat> so, yeah, this is just a really weird, star, <laughs> really weird star. Uh, it's possible there was a paper that was released a couple years ago that kind of disputed whether or not this star was a a TZO, which is the much easier and shorter way to say that. Um, and then it might actually just possibly be an asymptotic giant branch star, uh, which is another one of those red giant branches that we were talking about earlier. <laughs> so uh, we're still looking. We're still looking for some of these TZOs. We still haven't found any that are confirmed. Right. Well, Myra is an example of a an AGB, right? I have one of these. These. I now that I think about it, yeah. maybe I remember looking it up and then forgetting. <laughs> so I do that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, there are examples of, of where you know you, you, there's a star that's sort of swallowed another. You know, you have uh, binaries that are very close together, and sometimes they actually evolve, and you we, we think there's a. a a star that sort of merged into the core of the other star. And the, the spectrum of those objects is really strange. Oh, I bet. And that's what they were, they were using spectroscopy. They were looking at the spectra of these and looking for specific elements and specific chemicals uh, that are, so, are, are supposed to be associated with the TZOs. And uh, the paper that disputed it said, oh, I didn't see any of that, but I found this, which aligns it with an um, asymptotic giant branch star. Uh, yeah. Speaking of like finding elements in stars, <laughs> uh, here is, and I apologize to anyone who has this last name if I say it's super wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's pronounced Shabilski. It is Polish. And uh, this star is very strange on the account that uh, it has all of these elements that are just listed here. And these are all kind of on the bottom half of the periodic table. And as I mentioned before, typically stars don't fuse elements heavier than iron. Everything heavier than iron is going to come from a supernova. So that's why we find those heavy elements here on Earth is because it came from supernovas. Uh, but uh, stars, while like during their lifetimes and their cores, Nothing heavier than iron. There's just not enough energy in their cores for that. Uh, but we find all of these heavy elements, which are all heavier than iron. They're all down here somewhere. And that's what makes them uh, really interesting because we're finding very few 
heavy elements. And Shabilsky, who, you know, was looking at the star for the first time, even suggested there wasn't any iron in the star to begin with. And the origins of the, these elements are still pretty uncertain. There's a lot that we don't know about this star. Uh, it's possible that there were a lot of heavy elements that were made, like really heavy elements that were made that have since decayed into these, these ones. And these ones are not very stable themselves. They, they're going to decay as well. Uh, or perhaps there's a neutron star that's a source of this somewhere. Uh, we really don't know <laughs> how all these heavy elements got into this star. And this is the only star of its kind. We haven't found any that are like this anywhere else either. Uh, but yeah, Shabilsky's star. This is found in a, oh, not Alpha Centauri, that's a star. Uh, it's found in Centaurus, the constellation down in the Southern Hemisphere. So it's pretty weird. <laughs> uh, there we go. Uh, now this one, I definitely saved towards the end. This isn't the last one, but I saved it towards the end because uh, I'm sure a lot of people remember a couple of years ago reading articles about the alien superstructure. And this is that star. <laughs> it's called Tabby Star, which is much better than Alien Megastructure Star. Uh, but this is what makes it so weird is the astronomers that were like observing this light curve that they, they were searching for planets and to find planets you often you'll just look at uh, the light curves and if there's a dimming that means that something's passed in front of it and so chances are it's probably a planet or something but this light curve is incredibly irregular there's not much periodicity to it so they couldn't attribute this to planets uh, passing in front of this star and back in, I think, 2016 or 2017, it's, oh, it says 2017 to 2018 right here, right? Back then, they uh, recorded this and they had no idea what it was. So, of course, the obvious conclusion uh, was aliens. <laughs> At least that's what the press seemed to make it think. It's yeah. amazing. Astronomers will, they will or pretty much all scientists, if you find something weird, you're gonna be like, well, we're not gonna jump to any conclusions here, but the press sure loves to just say, oh, yep, it's aliens. It does. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> uh, there could have been like more, more of a uh, logical conclusion to jump to was like a series of comets, which I saw going around. And most likely this is this, just like Beetlejuice, dust. This was had a big dust cloud. Um, I believe this might be one of those younger stars. It could be even a protoplanetary disk going around this star. Uh, so it was just a whole bunch of dust that it turns out. And it's not, in fact, an alien megastructure. <laughs> uh, it looks like we have a um, mm. question from Glenn Frank here. The Shabilsky stars at large in mass or did it inherit these in heavy elements? And it is a large massive star. I, I think that it's, gosh, I, what did I uh, read? I think that it is a super giant. It, I mean, it's probably about several solar masses. I think it's an AP, yeah. AP star. Um, so type A, which is, you know, it's massive, okay. but not massively massive. It's almost, but not quite. <laughs> Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, and then uh, uh, Mohammed Al Aboud asked, "How come they all came together?" And I'm not actually sure which what, which one he's referring to for that question there. Maybe it's all the elements in Shabilsky's star. I think. I oh yeah, I, that's that's a good question. I think we're still trying to figure that out. <laughs> I, I mean, me personally, I'm. I'm just waiting for someone else to figure it out and then I can tell you guys. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so yeah, Tabby Star is is that famous mega structure star. I remember when because when I was like working public programs uh, way back then, I would get at least one person every night asking me about it. Oh yeah, it was all the rage. And you know, this is this. Uh, I'm glad you included this. It's a really good example of you know just how many different kinds of circumstellar environments you can see out there, right? You've got this, then you've got Betelgeuse. You know, you've got 
Myra, um, mm -hmm. and and some ones we haven't even talked about. A couple of cosmic confies ago, we we mentioned epsilon origi, which which has you know a binary with this big disk. So there's lots of ways you can see really weird things going on that doesn't not require aliens flying around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, also, if there were aliens, we're not going to tell you guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's top secret. <laughs> uh, the last star that I was gonna add here uh, was our sun, and the only the only thing I really had to say about the sun that makes it special, other than the fact that it is, it, it's in the rarities and some of the things. It's bigger than ninety eight percent of the stars in the galaxy. It's one of the very few stars that's actually not a binary system. And uh, it's the only star that has a planet with confirmed life on it. Uh, so uh, that's what makes our sun a weird star. Until we find life on another planet or on another star, we can only say it's our sun right now. <laughs> yep. Since we're talking about aliens. <laughs> yeah, we also, you know, I mean, we think of the sun as a stable, relatively sedate main sequence star. So, you know, normal in that sense. But one of the things we, we actually do find when we observe the sun and compare it to all its closest solar analogs, it really does seem to be pretty sedate. You know, that the overall variability of the sun over its activity cycle seems low compared to most of its analogous stellar cousins and and that leads to lots of interesting questions why is it low you know is the is the fact that there is a, a planet with with very suitable conditions for life a reason uh, because it is so sedate you know and so so there's lots of unanswered questions even about our our nearest star uh but yeah that's that's actually all i have yeah. uh for you guys i know that um well that's that's great thanks joe's yeah. um um, really good uh, uh, survey of some of these these strange stars we find in the galaxy, but you know we we could have gone on for but literally thousands of examples. I mean, every time you observe a star, you you find something weird, or if you observe it for a long period of time, it does something weird, and it's it's a very strange universe up there with with lots of interesting things to discover. So, well, so with that, I'm going to say thanks a lot, um, Joe, for a really interesting uh, presentation. Hope you've enjoyed uh, reading about some of the, some of the strange things. Um, oh, we, we oh. actually have one last question from Glenn Frank again, and, and you can probably answer this one better than me, but is the sun sedate activity due to its age mostly or other reasons? Um, so, uh, so the answer to that question is probably yes. Um, so a star's activity in general decreases as it ages and, and its rotation rate decreases because rotation rate drives the activity. So the sun at 5 billion years is, is getting to the stage of its life where, where when we look at other stars a little bit older than the sun, like six or seven billion years, they tend to not have much activity at all or the cycles are completely gone. Um, so, so it's certainly a, a factor of age and, and young stars are much more active. Um, but then the other reasons question is, you know, why would it be um, more sedate than other stars? And, and, you know, we don't, we don't have a good explanation for that because we don't fully understand the processes that generate the activity cycles and why some stars of comparable age might have much shorter cycles than other. Um, you know, it's, it's one of many, many open questions uh, uh, about in stellar astrophysics. So great question, and thank you, Glenn, for that question. Okay, so so as always, um, thanks thanks a lot, Joe. Thanks for Joyce joining yep. us. Uh, good show, and and um, encourage everybody. You know, go surf around and just look at the many other types of strange stars we can we can find up there. But then that's part of what keeps astronomy such an interesting uh, field for all of us. So with that, we're going to say thanks for joining us. Um, stay well, stay safe, and we'll see you on the next Cosmic Coffee. Yeah, thank you, guys.